Imagine being a soldier within a battalion on the march. You and your comrades file into a forest glade of resplendent wild beauty. The fragrant heaps of flowers in full red-yellow blue delight your nose. Myriad varieties of hardy fish, scales gleaming in silver fin, leap and splash amongst crystal clear brooks of water. Fruits as large as baskets, trees as broad as fortresses, air as sweet as honey. The woods back home are put to shame. The sheer verdant spectacle of it all leaves you slack jawed. However, as your company proceeds deeper into the brush, that all becomes ash in your mouth and dread in your gut. The woods seem to close in on you. Creatures of the forest, perched upon ancient bows, gaze down upon you, eyes filled with this day, despite being mere beasts of the wood, the air itself flexes, your ears barely pick up fell voices on the wind, whispering, hinting, promising, threatening. Out of nowhere, thick mists billow outwards from the trees, quickly enveloping your position. Four paces ahead of the main line, the journal of your company signals formation changes to avoid the sudden fog, but as he opens his mouth, blood pours out in torrents instead of marching orders, and a long black shaft, fletched with bright green feathers, grows from the pulpy ruin that used to be his neck. Your former general collapses before you, hands still outstretched to give orders now forever lost gently splattering your face with dark red blood. Before he hits the dirt, three more arrows hurtle forth, finding the hearts of his lieutenant, your captain, and your sergeant. Your fellow terrified footmen, now blinded by fog and totally deprived of leadership, attempt to form ranks on their own, even as swarms of arrows find additional homes within their chests. This is when the Fey Folk attack. It is over before you can even make three terrified breaths. The heavy cavalry on your flanks would have protected you, but they were outflanked and outshot by elves riding stags and elven steeds within the mist. The scouts in the vanguard would have warned you, but they had been deceived and gutted long ago by dryads disguised as beautiful women. Your wizards could have saved you but their minds were overwhelmed and their bodies blown apart by spell weavers. Your compatriots die in droves as the fey tide rushes to meet you, before the war dancers leap and flip behind your lines to cut graceful swaths of gore with enchanted steel. Tiny, barely visible entities startle you with flashes of light and poison you with needles and thorns flung at blinding speed towards vital organs as the diminutive beings flit to and fro amongst and underfoot the elves you double take in despair and pain as an enormous tree walks over the crumbling formation picking up artillery pieces within the baggage train crushing them like twigs with his gnarled appendages Bleeding from half a hundred cuts, your body ingloriously falls over with a thump upon the bed of red-yellow flowers whose beauty you had once appreciated, unaware it would become your grave marker. Dazed and stupefied by magic and poison and the quickness of the attack, you hear the sounds of the second battalion marching through the woods behind. Grim satisfaction floods your diminishing mind as you realize your allies will possibly avenge this cowardly assault. You turn your head, intending to fill your dying vision with vengeance wrought upon the Fey Folk, only to discover they have disappeared. The final glimpse of them and the last image of your life are eyes feral, savage eyes, aflame with bright burning malice, slowly fighting back 
into the forest line like fireflies before the dawn. Corpses, gore, and the pleas of dying men are all your compatriots find within the glade. From this scenario, you can see that the Wood Elves hit hard on the attack, appearing suddenly, inflicting substantial damage, then fading away back into the forest line before they can be retaliated against. This leads us to the first con of their faction. The Azrai must avoid retaliation at all costs because they have fragile, lightly armored units. Their high speed, second perhaps only to Slaneshi armies, is necessary as the Azrai cannot sustain prolonged battles of attrition. To partially make up for this, many of the forest spirits are beefy in hit points and physical resistance, but they are also vulnerable to fire damage, being entities of the woods, and are not as cost effective. While they have the best archers in the game, they lack artillery, so once again, if you are facing a gunpowder faction, or one with reliable, ultra-long range damage, you must use their speed or strong magical presence to counter this. Furthermore, the high damage and versatility of the roster pays for it in low numbers, so it will be important to use your flankers to prevent being surrounded. Thus, the faction requires skill to accentuate the power and speed of your army while compensating for their low defense and numbers to prevent being encircled and or outmuscled. Ambushes, skirmishing, cycle charging, vanguard deployment, hybrid rolls, powerful spells, overwhelming arrow fire, and stealth are the strategies competent Azrai commanders must rely on. This strategy was the case on tabletop as well. Every unit had movement five or more, meaning one of the main strategies was to keep moving while peppering your opponent with some of the best archers the game had to offer particularly with the various enchanted arrows players had to choose from. Whereas, generally trying to avoid getting bogged down in melees as neither their toughness stats nor their saves could compare to that of other factions. The most common use of their ability to place a piece of forest terrain was to place it in a glade guard unit, allowing them to fire and fight with an extra rank and rerolls to wounds. Venom thickets could also be effective, considering the penalties other factions would suffer, whereas your army had immunity to forest dangerous terrain. Abyssal Woods could be laden with Blade Guard, Eternal Guard, and Wildwood Rangers, allowing them to gain an edge in melee combat that they would normally lose if you successfully lure in enemies due to the fear Abyssal Woods cause. Unless they have poison attacks, wild riders who have strength 5 on the charge, units buffed to strength 5 or higher, or wildwood rangers, wood elves have a really hard time inflicting wounds on monsters and units with high toughness. Your tree men and forest dragons will be vulnerable to enemy war machines. Uh, the wood elves have no such unit to target beefy boys, so you're going to have to use the methods I listed um, earlier to deal with them. One common strategy was to offer up a, excuse me, a large uh, monster as a decoy basically, uh, so that your opponent would waste all their ammo on them while the rest of your army is able to get into position and um, do a lot of damage. The hide in forest and woodsman rules mean within forest, all ground wood elf units pass through trees without suffering terrain penalties and are invisible in forest terrain until the enemy gets close enough. Certain sections of the army also have the Forest Stalker rule, which increases ranged weapon accuracy and melee defense within forests. Blessing of the Ancients is based on a tabletop ability that improved casting rolls, 
The Ezrai draw on the spirits of the wood for protection and guidance. Spellcasters in the army therefore have higher power recharge rates while standing in the forest. In battle, the Wild Hunt could be a temporary bonus to charge stats, speed, and the addition of fear to any units deployed in the forest. On campaign, this could be a crusade-like mechanic that grants movement bonuses and reduced army upkeep towards a designated target on the map. Other Wood Elf factions may join in on assaulting the target depending on their disposition towards your faction and special traits, and rare items are gained at the completion of each hunt, though the downside could be that the targets are random and often far away, which in turn encourages the use and restoration of the world roots, but if armies do not make it fast enough, they start to suffer massive amounts of attrition to represent the Wood Elves starting to suffer from being away from Athel Lorne, which they are spiritually bound to. The Weave represents the Azrai's attunement to the ebb and flow of all that live and die within the natural order. When disaster strikes Athel Lorne, when the lands are polluted, and the trees are corrupted, this is reflected in the darker dispositions and actions of the Wood Elves. And when the green grows untainted, so follows the vibrant nature of the Azrai. They rely on these connections for their magic. This could be implemented as a combination of weaker versions of the High Elves and Dark Elves army abilities when it comes to the real-time battles, coinciding with the Wood Elves being a middle path between the two factions. Bonuses smaller than those gained from martial prowess at a battle start that are lost if health or leadership is lowered enough, representing the vibrancy of life and bonuses smaller than murderous prowess if enough bodies fall on the battlefield, representing the necessity of death within the weave. In campaign, restoring the weave could take the form of a meter with a pointer you need to keep in the middle, not too light, not too dark. Forming alliances, trade, using high life and light lures could push the needle towards the left, providing increased public order, increased growth, improving diplomatic relationships with order factions, but penalty to combat stats, diplomatic relationships with destruction factions, and reduced benefits from the wild hunt. Winning battles, raising settlements, assassinating enemy generals, using death, dark, and beast lores pushes the needle to the right, increasing benefits from wild hunts, improving combat stats, improving diplomacy with destruction factions and perhaps the recruitment of special units from the Wildwood, while decreasing public order and growth. When you reach the end of one side of the meter, you get something big, like maybe Avalorn becomes a vassal because the relationships between you have been strengthened through your noble actions, or perhaps you get a free incarnate elemental of life, which I will describe later in the new unit section of the video. And when you reach the other side of the meter, maybe you can call wild hunts outside of spring. And perhaps you can get access to dark elf mercenaries because they respect the strength that you have shown. If you keep the needle in the middle, you get no benefits and no penalties. I would make restoring connections between the Oak of Ages and the forests of the world part of the weave mechanic. Pushing the needle one way or the other, depending on the kind of forest the Oak of Ages is connected to. And the more forests you restore, the lesser the penalties and debuffs from either side of the needle, giving you more leeway to play as you please. Hotter seasons should push the needle slightly towards the dark side, and colder seasons towards the light. Wood Elves and earlier editions of Tabletop had a bird toting hero known as the Falconer. I could see this as a unique item for Glade Lords and Captains that functions as a summon similar to Krell. The Falcon would be used as a cheap, low health scout type unit with a special ability that lowers the melee attack or defense of any single entity unit it charges from the air. Given that it is a normal sized falcon and thus quite weak, skillful players would have to be careful in using this ability if they wish to keep the bird alive. I would probably also give it some kind of stalking ability uh, so it's basically invisible until you get up close to represent it's flying pretty high in the sky, so it's hard to see. This would increase its utility and survivability. The world roots uh, 
are the nexus of global magic and the genesis of life. On tabletop, wood elves had an ability to turn a section of the table into forest terrain. In Total War, world roots could let the player select a small section of the default vanguard deployment zone to transform into forest terrain. That section now allows any non-vanguard units to deploy as vanguard, which represents the Oak of Ages allowing transportation. Emphasis on the small size of this zone for balancing purposes. You don't want to be able to, you know, vanguard deploy your entire army. On tabletop, players could choose from one of several forest terrain types, each with unique effects. Abyssal Woods contain an intangible malevolence that causes fear and insanity in those traveling through it. Blood forests remain dormant until someone nearby uses magic, at which point they awaken, eager to feed upon the spellcasting culprit. These could deal damage to spellcasters who pass through the terrain. Fungus forests are teeming with hallucinogenic mushrooms. In Total War, these forests could have a 50-50 chance of rampaging units or stunning them for a while. Venom thickets are filled with poisonous creatures and grant those within poison damage to their melee attacks. The Wildwood contains the most wrathful and vindictive spirits, so in Total War I can see this causing magic damage over time while the enemy moves through it. In Total War, after the release of the latest DLC, Wood Elves will be able to teleport using the Deep Roots mechanic on the campaign map. The regular World Roots is just an army stance that allows you to bypass terrain in a fashion similar to the Underway stance used by the Skaven and the Dwarves. Much of the Azurai culture is tied to the seasons. During the winter, the forest spirits slumber and the Wood Elves take charge of the forest's protection. In the spring, Orion comes back to life, calling the wild hunt to begin anew, and the forest spirits awaken, eager for new prey to slaughter. Best way to implement this is increase in enemy attrition and forest spirit recruitment, but a decrease in public order in the warmer months to represent the forest being better able to defend against intruders and the awakening of the forest spirits. The wild hunt should also be exclusive to spring, in the winter, there should be bonuses in recruitment to elven units, decreased attrition, and a public order bonus to show how everything slows down in the winter, but the forest spirits' hijinks are not as malicious and frequent. It would also be nice to have different campaign map animations for each season. Of course, the faction known for their archers would have multiple kinds of enchanted arrows. Hagbane tips inflict poison in game. They are also known as Calyx Claws, referencing a powerful crone in Azrai folklore and only require a scratch for the lethal venom to settle into the target's bloodstream. Starfire shafts are crafted from starwood trees whose bark all impure beings recoil from. Moonfire shafts are enchanted under the light of a tainted moon, searing the flesh of those with pure intention. On tabletop, these two upgrades would add flaming attacks and extra damage to the forces of destruction for Starfire, and extra damage to the forces of order for Moonfire. Only Starfire shafts made it into Total War, and in-game they provide fire damage and armor piercing. To implement Moonfire Shafts, I would simply exchange the fire damage for magic damage. Swift Silver Shards were crafted from wood so light and sturdy that they seemed to almost eagerly fly from the drawstring. On tabletop, this upgrade provided multiple attacks, I suppose, to represent the speed with which archers are able to fire and reload these arrows, or to show the arrows are light and strong enough to fire off multiple at a time. In game, they add an extra projectile. In Total War, Glade Guard can take Starfire Shafts or Hagbane Tips. Glade Riders can take Hagbane Tips, and Deepwood Scouts can take Swift Silver Shards. I would keep these as is, save for extending availability of all three variants to all units mentioned here, and to Hawk Riders. 
these flying units suffer low usage in multiplayer. The addition of ammunition variants could increase their utility, but they may have to experience a deficit in another area, such as armor, speed, or leadership to maintain balance. Of those arrow variants not currently in game, the ensorcelled tips of arcane bodkins cut through armor as effectively as flesh. On tabletop, this added penalties to armor saving throws, so perhaps armor sundering would be how Total War implements the upgrade. The shafts of True Flight arrows are magically instilled with a basic sentience. These arrows desire to bury themselves within the hearts and brains of those targets their owner has aimed at. These homing arrows could give an extra punch to skirmish-focused armies who need to fire on the go or from cover, nullifying any penalties from firing while moving, detrimental terrain, and spells that decrease accuracy or having homing properties similar to the Hell Cannon, Doom Divers, or the Fireball spell. The banal dysfunction of sieges in Total War Warhammer is absurd, especially compared to sieges in previous Total War games. Anyways, the Wood Elves are not known for their ability to demolish castles, as evident by their history of failed assaults on Dwarven Carracks. The treemen and dragons of their armies are usually left to deal with any heavy fortifications. And if that fails, their spell singers and spell weavers use magic to soften the defenses. Vol's hammer is a good start to fully implementing this lore into gameplay, albeit it is a high elf spell rather than a wood elf one. The simple damage spell destroys walls but it should be chained so walls themselves may be targeted, rather than exclusively units on walls. In fact, tree men, forest dragons, and every monstrous single entity unit in the game should be able to attack walls rather than only gates as they do now. Returning to the topic of siege spells, the mist spell we will be discussing Adding in alongside the lore of Athol Lorne later on in the video could be effective in concealing troops approaching walls from enemy missiles. Another spell I'd like to see added to sieges could be implemented by changing the silly ladder mechanic to a Wood Elf exclusive siege only ability that covers sections of the defending wall in vines. Eternal Guard, War Dancers, and other basic infantry can then climb up to face the enemy. To differentiate this from the ladders other factions will still likely use, make the climbable surface area wider so that more troops can scale at once, but balance it by withering the vines away after a few minutes so that Wood Elf players have a more narrow window of time to get their troops over the walls. I would also give Dryads the ability to climb walls by default, as their appendages are whip-like branches with wooden grip, known for tearing men apart easily barehanded. Perhaps some of the more elite and stealthy units, such as Way Watchers and Wildwood Rangers, can be given grappling hooks to represent their more clandestine nature. Anything to be rid of butt ladders. Anything. Last of the siege spells I can think of is one that summons a ramp. In older editions of Warhammer, elves could use magic to move literal hills around. In Total War Warhammer, let spell singers raise the earth to create verdant ramps of grass and dirt, allowing infantry to walk right up to the ramparts, balance it like with the vines and make them temporary. Remember how Tolkien was partially inspired to create Ents from the Macbeth line where soldiers used leaves and twigs as camouflage to stealthily approach a castle? In medieval warfare, archers often used wheeled shields known as mantlets. Give Wood Elf archers a version of that except covered in leafy bushes so the enemy thinks they're being attacked by an army of shrubs shooting arrows, like in Macbeth. Decrease their movement speed and accuracy in exchange for an increase in missile resistance and armor. Tree Man Destroyers and Tree Man Guardians are two potential unit variants that did not exist on tabletop, 
but have a basis in lore and would be useful for attackers and sieges. I'll explore both of these in later sections of the video. As you can see, options for the Wood Elves laying siege should be expanded, but still limited compared to other factions given their more guerrilla flavor. Defending an area, however, is a different matter. Wood Elves live in the woods. They should be knowledgeable in using the ground to their advantage, particularly in regards to laying traps. With the implementation of deployable traps in Three Kingdoms in Troy, Creative Assembly should spread the love to Azrai. Way Watchers could deploy slowing and damaging obstacles in older tabletop editions. These traps included spike pits, nets, snares, and giant hidden spikes known as impalers. In Total War, I believe most of these traps should be set before siege battles, like with Eltharion's last campaign mission, rather than relegated to a Waywatcher ability. Spike pits should be hidden by terrain until an enemy touches one. The units then fall into a slightly lower section of the ground, are briefly stunned, and take moderate damage. There is an IRL plant named Tribulus Terrestris whose fruit has spines sharp enough to puncture shoes. These could be a Wood Elf version of Caltrops, slowing down enemies, especially cavalry, but also doing damage over time from the thorns containing poison, as animals are known to die from its consumption. For nets, give Waywatchers a projectile like Night Goblins, but instead of Goblin Fanatics, it's a net that stuns, which is funny because on tabletop, Night Goblins had nets as a projectile option as well. The Impaler could be an anti-large variant of the Spike Pit, where the Spike Pit contains multiple smaller spikes for skewering infantry. I would make the Impaler a hidden massive spike that shoots up from the ground upon activation, knocking down and severely damaging single entities that are caught in the trap, making it a uh, monster killer, essentially. In the lore, wood elves build their fortifications by singing them into shape from trees. This means their castles, towers, and forts are made mostly from roots, branches, and greenery. Therefore, standing on walls or behind them could count as standing on forest terrain, with all the accompanying benefits for wood elves and all the debuffs for non Azrai. Since the architecture is made of living material as well, perhaps wood elf walls and gates could have some form of regeneration. Leaning into the living architecture theme, the wood elf fortresses would surely have secret exits hidden by branches that grow and retract as needed, allowing sorties to stealthily flank besiegers. Let's get even more crazy and add a damage over time debuff to enemies climbing walls because of thorns that shoot out from the sentient wood the building is made of. For built-in wall defenses, archer towers are given, but what about rocks dropped from murder holes? These murder holes could even be upgraded to drop swarming wasp nests that lower melee attack for a time.